Uh, we have been talking about the awesome tricks for doing the derivative. The derivative of a polynomial is uh, very easy once you know the appropriate tricks to use. I thought just as a little warm-up, um, so as a very, very, very warm warm-up, what if I wanted, say, the derivative of, you see that? I'm going to get a little thicker lines here. Derivative of 5x squared minus 7x plus 18x to the, I don't like that. 8x to the 4, how about that? I don't want to multiply. The derivative of that. Anyone want to just shout it out? If you know what you're doing, you can just say the answer, basically. 10x minus 7. I like that. 10x minus 7. What else? Yeah, you got you to gotta multiply something here. 32x. Cubed, right? That's 4 times 8 is 32. Remember the rule is you multiply the exponent times whatever the coefficient was, and then you decrease the exponent by 1. In the middle uh, here, in the case of 7 times x, any number times x, you just get the coefficient. The x disappears, the coefficient remains. All right? This is the basic trick. Um, let's do a cute little sort of physics-type problem. Let's say... Um, a particle is moving, and the position is this function. How about s of t equals 3t cubed minus 7t squared plus 5t plus 2. And let's say this is in uh, meters. The time is in seconds. All right. Uh, and I will ask you two questions, the part A, the part B. Part A is how fast is it moving? At uh, time equals one second. And the part B is what's the acceleration at uh, time equals two seconds? All right, so neither of these is really very hard to do if you know the appropriate things to do. Anyone want to suggest for the part A, what's my, what's my strategy? What should we do for part A? How fast is it moving at one second? The function I told you describes the position. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, find the derivative and plug in one, he said. I agree. If I have the, I gave you the position function. Uh-oh. I think my wire just cut out. Sorry. Find the derivative. Yeah. Okay. I didn't do anything. Find the derivative and then plug in one, he said. I agree. The derivative would be, uh, I'll write s prime of t. You go down the list there, take the derivative each time. 3t cubed becomes 9t squared, and then minus 14t, and then plus 5. The plus 2 goes away because the derivative of a constant is 0. All right, this represents the velocity, right? I hope you remember. The derivative of the position represents the velocity. So, my question was, how fast is it moving? What you're interested in is the velocity. And then at time equals one second, I just plug in one for t. So this is s prime of one. Nine times one squared minus 14 times one plus five is whatever that is, right? Nine minus 14 plus five. That's zero, isn't it? All right, so that means, I suppose, at that moment, the thing is not moving, or maybe it's like in the middle of turning around, so that its, it's instantaneous velocity at that moment is zero. And I suppose the units would be, what would the units be? Meters per second, right? It's a, um, this is the velocity. My units for the function are meters and seconds. And so the uh, derivative units will be meters per second. All right, any, any thoughts about that one? How about the next one? What's the acceleration? What should I do for that? 
Yeah. Yeah, remember the acceleration is the second derivative, or it's the derivative of the velocity. So I'm going to find the derivative again for the part B. I go S double prime of T. So I read S prime of T here and take the derivative of that. It's going to be 18 minus, sorry, 18T minus 14. All right, and then plug in T equals 2. So S double prime of 2 is 18 times 2 minus 14, whatever that is. Uh, 22, I believe. And the units there are meters per second per second, which you can write just like that, or you can write it this way. Sometimes meters per second squared. That's the acceleration. All right, great. I hope that these are meant to be just a little quick, quick, quick little quickie. All right. Uh, I had some for you to try out just to make sure everybody's cool with the power rule. I mean, everybody loves the power rule, right? So. How about you try these few here? Um, each time, I just want you to take the derivative. I give you two very simple ones and then something a little more interesting. These really are not very interesting if, if all I tell you is, is a polynomial. You can pretty much immediately write the answer just as fast as I write the question. Uh, this third one here is a little more interesting. 7x to the 4 minus 8x divided by x. And then the fourth one is also a little interesting. 3x plus 5, the whole thing squared. So for those last two, you will need to somehow re-express those things so that they look like polynomials. And I will leave it to you to decide what to do. Change them around first so that they look like polynomials. And then you can do the, uh, the old power rule. And then I got one more. This is a slightly more complicated question. Find any x values where the slope is horizontal. For this here function. All right, see what you think. The first two you should be able to do immediately. The others you may have to think briefly.
I'll give you another minute, and then we can talk about them. All right, let's talk about these. I don't know if you uh, worked them all out. It's fine. Um, the first one, so the first two are very straightforward. I hope that they worked out for you. This is 10x plus 7 minus 15x to the 4. I hope that's what you got. Actually, what I just wrote, I don't like what I just wrote. Anybody, uh, anybody also not like what I wrote? Uh, no, I don't really care about that. I know some people like to put the highest power first. You can do that if you want to, but actually that's not what I was referring to. Actually, there's something wrong with what I just wrote. Yeah. Yes, the equal sign. Thank you. Um, what's wrong with the equal sign there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not equal. They, they are uh, like, they, one is the derivative of the other one, but they're not equal. So I hope that you didn't just put an equal sign. How should I write it? Well, one way I could have, so one thing you could do is this. So now this is correct. The derivative of that equals that. Um, but uh, I mean, there's, there's a few correct ways that you can write that. But please don't write the equal sign. Uh, I want to have some, res some kind of respect for the equal sign. Um, it always happens like right before a calculus test or something, somebody's like, wait a minute. Um, Sine of x is cosine, and cosine is uh, negative sine, right? And I'm like, well, no. Like the, you mean the derivative of this is equal to this. Like there, there are some formulas that you should remember, but don't, don't abuse the equal sign, right? That's all I'm saying. So this one, sometimes you can, you can do like this if you want. That's, that's fine. 60x to the 9, right? I hope that's what you got. That is the derivative of the other thing. They are not equal, okay? What about this one? 7x to the 4 minus 8x divided by x. What's your strategy for that? I know some of you did this one. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, right. You can, you can basically just like actually divide by x here. So the moral of the story is don't just try to take the derivative on the top and also the derivative on the bottom. That actually is not legal, and we're going to talk today about why, why exactly you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, in this case, you can actually just sort of factor an x out on the top and then cancel dim x's. Anybody got a problem with the equal sign I just used here? No, actually, this is a legitimate equal sign, right? Those two things, they really are the same. And then... In the next step, I'm going to take the derivative. But actually, let me just say, this is equal to, ah, oh, sorry. Come on. Skinny mini. This is equal, that's too thick now. All right. That's pretty good. Right? These really are equal. And then, I'm going to actually take the derivative. I'm not going to use an equal sign. I don't know how you want to write this. I'll just say the derivative is... Uh, 21x squared, and then nothing, right? No minus 8. Okay, excellent. This is, you know, some people, uh, uh, some people are like, come on, give me a break with the equal sign. But actually, when you're doing a problem like this, it is very confusing. You have to keep straight the fact that when you begin, there's sometimes some steps where you are rewriting the thing you start with. And then, after you rewrite it a bunch of times, then you actually do the derivative. And there, there's, there's a different thing there. There's like a, a separate procedure when you actually take the derivative where you should not use the equal sign. All right, what about this one? 3x plus 5 squared. I'm going to move this away. Oh, look at that. Uh, this one you should have done like this. 3x plus 5 times 3x plus 5. 
Now you may know there's a special derivative rule that you can also use just directly on the thing on the left called the chain rule, which we're going to talk about next time. But uh, for now, you can do this one without the chain rule. And this is how I would do it. Do the FOIL, all right? I get 9x squared plus, in the middle, 15, and then another 15, and 30x, and on the end, 25, all right? Is this the answer? No, that's just the same as what I started with. You can tell because I used equal signs. That is equal to what I started with. Now I'm going to take the derivative. The derivative is 18x plus 30. I hope you got that. All right, great. And then the last one. I saw a bunch of people did this one. What's your uh, strategy for this one? What do you think? Yes, where the slope is horizontal. Remember the slope um, is the derivative. And horizontal, the slope uh, being horizontal means the derivative is zero. And so I want to take the derivative first of all, which is easy enough. 3x cubed minus, sorry, 4x cubed minus 12x. That's it, right? This is the derivative, which represents the slope, and I want to know when is the slope equal to zero. For which x values is this equal zero? So I set this equal to zero, and then solve for x. And I can solve for x by factoring here. I could take out a 4x, and what remains will be x squared minus 3. And then this guy gives me, you know, 4x equals zero, and then x squared minus 3 equals zero, right? This is x equals zero, so this is one. I'm going to get, you know, several answers. One of them is x equals 0. And then this one I could write as x squared equals 3, x equals plus or minus root 3. So here I have actually three separate answers. 0, square root 3, and negative square root 3. All right. Any, anybody have any questions about those? These are those. Great. Um, what I want to talk about today is derivatives, you know, for the next like probably many class periods, we're going to talk about derivatives of increasingly more complicated functions. So as of now, we know how to do polynomials, which are not terribly complicated. But um, what about more complicated things? For example, I said there's actually a special rule to use for something like this. The rule for this one is, is useful, um, or it applies whenever you have one function stuck inside of another function. So here what you have is... 3x plus 5, which is one thing, but then that whole thing is jammed inside of the square. So um, that's a rule. There's a special rule for that. There's also a special rule for something like this, which is a quotient of two things. You know, it's in a fraction. There's also a rule, we didn't do one like that, but a rule for when you have two functions multiplied together. So what I want to talk about for most of today is the derivative of a product or a quotient. All right, the derivative of a product or a quotient. We got rules for those things. They are called the product rule and the quotient rule. Um, easy to remember the names of them at least. Uh, so we've already talked about the derivative of two things added together. We already know that the derivative, remember this is one way to write, d dx of f plus g means derivative of f plus g. This is equal to the derivative of f plus the derivative of g, right? Oops. Derivative of g. This rule is so simple that it doesn't even really have a name, but this tells you what to do when you have two things added together. How do you find the derivative of that? The answer is you just find the derivative of each of the two things. You add the two answers together, all right? We've been doing this already today many times when you took the derivative of a polynomial. You just go down the list and do the derivative each time. Okay, what about a product? What about something like derivative of f times g? This is what we need to discuss. And I will just tell you straight up, it's not just f prime times g prime, unfortunately. This would make things uh, quite a bit easier if it were, but it's not. When you have two things multiplied together, you cannot just take the derivative of the first one and also take the derivative of the second one. And I wanted to, just, just to uh, 
prove that to you? Check it out. Um, what if I did derivative of x squared times x to the 5, all right? Now, to do this correctly, I would just actually multiply them together first inside the parentheses and then take the derivative. Anyone, uh, anyone remember your rules about multiplying things like that? What is x squared times x to the 5? Did you, yeah? X to the 7, yeah. In this case, you should add the exponents. So this would be, sorry, derivative of x to the 7, right? And the derivative of that would be 7x to the 6, all right? So if you wanted to do it correctly, that's, that's what you should do in this case. But what if I uh, was being foolish and I just did the derivative of each one separately? But what if I did the derivative of x squared separately, derivative of x to the 5? This is a bad life choice. The first one would be derivative of x squared is 2x, right? And then the derivative of x to the 5 is 5x to the 4. And if you put that together, you get 10x to the 5. They are not the same, all right? So these two here, they are not the same. I'm just trying to show everybody why. The derivative of two things multiplied together, it requires a special rule, and you cannot just take the derivative of each part separately. You will get something, but it's not going to be the correct answer, all right? But there is a rule for it, and it's called the product rule. We need to work it out. I'm going to work it out just once using the definition of the derivative, and then we're basically just going to memorize what the answer is because you don't want to, re you don't want to think this through every time. But here's how you would do it. If I had derivative of f of x times g of x, all right, just this once, I'm going to use the limit definition to just to figure out what the formula is, and then we're just going to memorize the, uh, the result that we get at the end. So it's going to be lim h goes to 0. Remember how this works? You go f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. But this time, instead of f as just a function by itself, we have f times g. So what it looks like, I plug x plus h first. It looks like f of x plus h times g of x plus h. I am plugging into this whole thing, x plus h instead of x, all right? And then I go minus, and then I use that whole thing by itself, f of x times g of x, all of this divided by h, all right? And what can we do with this? This, when you look at this, it's actually not obvious what you should do next, but there's sort of a tricky little trick which you've probably seen this kind of trick before. It, you, in order to make this work, you, you kind of have to know how to do it. Um, it's very hard to come up with this kind of trick on your own. But what I'm going to do is add and subtract the same thing. This is f of x plus h times g of x plus h. I'm going to go minus f of x plus h times g of x plus f of x plus h times g of x and then minus the last part. So what you have is the same as before, only I inserted these, these two guys in the middle. I created them out of nowhere. They are the same. One is a plus and one is a minus. So you are allowed to do that. Uh, and then, of course, all of this divided by h. The purpose of creating those new ones in there is that now we can separate this into two fractions and factor out a piece of each. So. If I isolate the first two, it says f of x plus h, g of x plus h, minus f of x plus h, g of x, divided by h. And then the other part, I'm going to break into its own fraction, f of x plus h, g of x, minus f of x, g of x, <coughs> all over h, right? We break it into two fractions. I split apart that that bit in the middle that I invented. And then from each of those two fractions, you can factor something out. Does anybody see what, um, what can I factor out of the first fraction? I see a common factor in, in the numerator there. Yeah? Yeah, f of x plus h can come out of the first fraction. 
And then what remains here is g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h, right? And in the second one, it looks like those things both have a g of x on them in the second one. So I'm going to pull that guy out, g of x in the front, and then the fraction looks like f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. All right? And we're pretty much done at this point. I don't know if you feel like we're reaching it, getting anywhere, but actually we are getting somewhere. At this point, you can just take the limit of the whole thing. So what we have, you want to think of this in like four, four different parts here. Each of them, you can take the limit as h goes to zero. What do you get from the first thing? f of x plus h. When I take the limit as h goes to zero, I just plug in zero for h, and it becomes... This guy becomes f of x, right? When h becomes 0, f of x plus h becomes f of x. What about the next thing? g of x plus h minus g of x over h. Does that look like anything to anybody? It looks like something to me. It is the derivative of g of x, she said. I agree. Right? That's what the derivative of g means. I mean, if you were going to use the definition, which we usually don't, but that's what it is. Yeah. Okay? So this is really f of x times g prime of x, and then plus g of x, I guess, is just g of x. There was no h in there to begin with. And then the last one, for the same reason, is the derivative of f. All right? And this is our rule that we're just going to remember. So we're not, you're not going to think through all that stuff that I just did. Um, if you can handle it, we're just going to remember the rule at the end. So I will write this again. This is called the product rule. It tells you how to take the derivative of a product, and you definitely need to memorize this. We're going to use it so often that I hope uh, it's not a big deal to memorize. If you have the derivative of a product, it is f of x, g prime of x, plus g of x, f prime of x. That's the formula for the product rule. You may have learned this in some other order. That's fine. You can, to some extent, rearrange the order here. You can add them in the opposite order, and then in each of those things, you could multiply them in the opposite order. But they have to kind of associate with each other in the proper way. All right, what I, you know, when I remember the product rule, if you, uh, if you approach me, you wake me up in the middle of the night and ask me, right now, tell me the product rule. Um, I actually don't, I don't think of it in terms of a, an equation like this. I think of sort of as a slogan. You can remember this however you want, but to me, I always think uh, the right-hand side here in words, it means the first thing times the derivative of the second plus the second thing times derivative of the first. Where I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the f is the first thing and the g is the second thing, right? You have two things multiplied together. And in the product, what you see on the right-hand side here is the first thing, just like it is times the derivative of the second thing, and then plus the second thing, just like it is, times the derivative of the first thing. And you got to keep it straight. Which When am I taking the derivative of each part versus when am I just using the part as is? This is the product rule. Let's just do a few quick little examples here. Uh, maybe I thought I'd... Let's, let's revisit that, um, that sort of cautionary example that I said before, the derivative of x squared times x to the 5, right? This, of course, if you want to do it properly, you should just multiply on the inside first and then take the derivative. It's 7x to the 6. But what if I wanted to do this using the product rule? All right, it would be, you know, f times g prime plus g times f prime, right? That's the product rule where the f is the first thing and the g is the second thing. What would we get if we actually worked it out that way? The f is the first one, which is x squared, so that would be x squared times, and then the g prime is the derivative of the second one, it would be 5x to the 4, right? That's the f and the g prime. This is the f, this is the g prime. I need this to be thick, too. And then we got, come on, plus 
The G and the F prime. The G is the second part, which is x to the 5. And the F prime is the derivative of the first part, which would be 2x, right? The first part was x squared. So this, what I just wrote, this would be G and F prime, right? Or this was F and G prime. And by some kind of magic, it actually does add up to six, uh, 7x to the 6. So the first one would be 5x to the 6, and the second one would be 2x to the 6, and it really does add up to 7x to the 6, all right? So this is how to do it right. Even though, I mean, in this particular example, there's no reason to do the product rule because this is so much easier to do it just uh, this way. But um, I just wanted to show you how, if you wanted to think of it as a product, that's how you would do it properly. All right, let's try just a few more simple examples. How about um, for this function, f of x equals 8x to the 5 minus 7x plus 1 times 11 minus x squared. Find f prime of 1. All right. Now, this may be slightly confusing because the whole thing, which is a product, I called it f, uh, where in the formula for the product rule, I had, like, the f is the first one and the g is the second one. But, you know, sometimes something else will also be called f. But anyway, when I do the product rule, this is the first part, the 8x to the 5 minus 7x plus 1, and then this is the second part, the 11 minus x squared. So I'm going to do the product rule to find, so let me just say first, I'll find um, f prime of x, and then plug in 1. you got to take the derivative first and then plug it in. Um, if you plug the number in first, then you'll just end up with a, a, a number, and you won't be able to take the derivative, but the derivative of just a number is 0. So don't plug it in first. Take the derivative first, then plug it in. Anyway, f prime of x is, I'm going to do the product rule. I'll just use that, that slogan form because I don't want to get confused about what, it, what exactly is f here. It's going to be the first thing times the derivative of the second thing plus the second thing times the derivative of the first thing. That would be the first thing, 8x to the 5 minus 7 minus 1 times. Anybody say what's the derivative of the second thing? Negative 2x, yeah. That was the first part times the derivative of the second part. And then I go plus the second part like it is. 11 minus x squared, times derivative of the first part. What do you say? Say it. Uh -huh. Yeah, great. That's that. This is the derivative. I hope you put the parentheses there. They matter in this case. Uh, if you left out any of those parentheses which I wrote, I mean, what you wrote means something different from what I wrote, so uh, you should get them right. Okay, uh, anyway, this is not my final answer. This is f prime of x. I asked you to find f prime of 1, so f prime of 1 is just all of that stuff, but with a 1 plugged in. 8, you know, any power of 1 is just 1. It's like that, times negative 2, and then plus 11 minus 1 times 40 minus 7, right? And that, whatever that is, is my answer. You can, we add it all up. 8 minus 7 is negative, uh, uh, plus, positive 1 plus 1, so that's 2 times negative 2. And then I got plus 10 times 33. I like multiplying by 10. This is negative 4 plus 330, which is uh, 326, I guess. Is that right? I get a different answer on my paper. I think my paper's wrong, though. Anyone, anyone agree with me on this one? I think so. I got lucky. This is a 10 out there. That's what the kids these days, I don't know if you know, the kids these days talk about math differently. They, like, change the elementary school math system. They talk about friendly numbers. You guys into friendly numbers? I ask my kid one, I ask my kids every so often, what are you, what are you doing in math? Because, you know, I have an interest in mathematics. But they, um, once, like, when my kid was in first grade, they're like, yeah, we, we talk about friendly numbers. It means, um, like, 10 is a friendly number. 
because it's easy to add things to 10 or multiply by 10. So they always want to rephrase things in terms of the friendly numbers. Right. I just thought you would like that little story about friendly numbers. Um, any questions about that? This was the product rule. Take the derivative <laughs> using the product rule, and then we plug number in. All right, I got, I got one more example, and then I have one for you to try. So this is uh, like slightly more abstract. For some function, for some function f of x, um, what is this? And your answer, I'm not telling you what f of x is, so your answer will involve, like, there will be some f of x stuff left over in your answer. You won't be able to fully tell me specifically what that is. First of all, anybody uh, recognize this weird thing here? What does this mean? d squared, dx squared? Yeah. Yeah, that means the second derivative. So what we have to do here is take the derivative of that twice, right? We do it once, whatever you get. Do it again. All right. So let's just start by saying the first derivative of x to the 5 times f of x. That is times. I didn't write the dot before, but it is x to the 5 times f of x. So you should do this using the product rule, right? I go the first thing times the derivative of the second thing. The first thing is x to the 5, just like that, times the derivative of the second thing. I don't really know what f is, so I'll just write f prime of x. That's the derivative of f of x, whatever that is. And then plus the second thing like it is, f of x, times the derivative of the first thing would be 4x to the 5. What? 5x to the 4, sorry. 5x to the 4. Like that. All right. And you really can't simplify it any more than that because I, you don't know what f is or what f prime of x is. All right. And then, this is not the end. That's just the first derivative. And then what is the second derivative? Times f of x is... Well, I'm going to... Um, of all of this stuff here, I'm going to take the derivative again. All right. And what we have there is actually two separate things and each of those two things, I need to do the product rule. All right. The first one is x to the five times x prime of x, uh, times f prime of x, and I will do the product rule for the first one. It's going to be the first thing, like it is, times the derivative of the second thing, which I could write like that, and then plus the second thing, which is f prime of x times the derivative of the first thing, which is five x to the four. All right. All of that just came from the first part, so this. I'm going to try and clarify here. This guy right here gives me all of this, right? That was the product rule applied to the first thing. And then I go plus, and now I do the second part. The product rule applied to the second part. So the second part being this part is going to give me all of this stuff here. The product rule says I do the first thing like it is times the derivative of the second thing. That would be 20x cubed. Plus, the second thing like it is, 5x to the 4 times the derivative of the first thing would be f prime of x. And that's what we get. All right. That one was a little stranger, just because I didn't tell you what the f was. Any thoughts about that? Excellent. I got one for you to try. Just a simple product rule problem. Should only take a moment if you know what you're doing. How about you find the derivative of x to the 5 plus 7x squared times 8x minus x to the 10. See what you think. I'll give you a moment.
I'll give you another minute and then we'll talk about it. All right, let's talk about it. So, you should have known the first thing times the derivative of the second thing plus the second thing times the derivative of the first thing. I already wrote down the first thing just the way it is, and then the derivative of the second part should have been 8 minus 10x to the 9, right? Like so. And then plus the second part just like it is, 8x minus x to the 10 times... The derivative of the first part, what's that? Excellent. 5x to the 4 plus 14x. And that's my answer. Um, I don't know about your, your upbringing. I know some people are trained that you always got to, like, simplify things. Uh, I don't know I don't know why. This, this is the answer. And I would, um, if it was up to me, I would leave my answer just looking like that. All right? If for some reason you wanted to, there are cases when you might want to simplify this by do, it's kind of a pain to do, but do the foil on each of those two things and then add it all together. I mean, I hope you could do that if you had to, but no reason to. If I ask you to tell me the derivative, that's the derivative. All right? Excellent. Great. This is the product rule. You should remember the product rule. It's not so hard to remember, I don't think. Um... Let's talk about quotients, all right? The quotient rule is for dealing with quotients. This, of course, means you're taking the derivative of something like this. The derivative of something divided by something else. There is a special rule for this also, and I will, just like before, I will start off by saying it's not this, f prime divided by g prime. You cannot just take the derivative on the top and separately take the derivative on the bottom. That's the wrong answer. I mean, that is a thing, like, you can do that and get an answer, but it's not the correct answer. So, instead, you need to use what we call the quotient rule, and I, I don't want to go through the whole derivation, but I want to give you, like, a flavor of what it would look like. What does it actually look like if I try to use the definition of the derivative using the limit thing? with a quotient. Well, <coughs> as usual, it would be lim h goes to zero. And I'm going to have a big fraction with a divided by h, right? The first thing you see up in the numerator should be this whole thing with, instead of x, with x plus h plugged in. So it's going to look like f of x plus h divided by g of x plus h, like that, right? You take the entire original function, which in this case is a quotient, and you replace x by x plus h. And then I go minus just the original function as it is written. All right. And now this one is, gets a little complicated because what you have to do to simplify this is in the numerator, you have to do a common denominator. We did some examples like this, which I think you remember as like a uh, post-traumatic experience. It's a, it's a real pain to deal with the... Um, the uh, denominators like this. But I'm going to do a few steps of this. I'm not going to do the whole thing. But um, as, I, as I do in these problems, I find it easier. Rather than a whole big thing divided by h, I'm going to just put a 1 over h in the front. And then what remains is that numerator part. And the common denominator, the best you can do, because there is no sort of least common denominator to choose here, you just have to use the product. So the denominator is going to be g of x plus h times g of x. So what it looks like is f of x plus h times g of x plus, sorry, times g of x over g of x plus h times g of x. That's, 
I multiplied the top and the bottom by g of x to make the common denominator in the first one. And then minus, this one I multiplied by g of x plus h on the top and the bottom. Divided by g of x plus h times g of x. All right. And this, then you can actually subtract them. It will look like lim h goes to 0, 1 over h, and then on the inside, f of x plus h, g of x, minus f of x plus h, g of x plus h, all over g of x plus h times g of x. All right. This is still pretty messy. From here, you do that same, like, add and subtract the same thing in the middle. And here, I don't want to go through all the details. I will just say add and subtract. Like I said before, it's not at all obvious how you should do that. If you don't know, if you don't already know what you're doing, it's hard to decide what exactly am I going to add and subtract in the middle there. But anyway, once you do it, you can separate it out in this way. You add and subtract the same thing and then separate the fraction apart, just like we did for the product. It looks like this. It turns out you can factor g of x out of the first one, and then what remains is this. And out of the second one, you can factor f of x, and what remains is the g stuff. And this whole thing will be divided by that common denominator. It really ends up being basically the same as the product rule. The important difference is, first of all, there's a minus in the middle, and also there's this weird common denominator thing. All right. But anyway, once I take the limit here, all these fractions up top will turn into derivatives, and then everything else will just sort of be left over. So I take the limit. What I end up with is g of x times f prime of x on the top. That's this stuff, right? This g of x, when I take the limit, is still g of x. This fraction here, when I take the limit, is the derivative. Minus, sorry, I'm eating my eyeball. <coughs> I shouldn't do that with the COVIDs. Get the eye COVID. f of x times g prime of x, right? That's the second part up top. And then the bottom, that common denominator, actually is going to stay as part of my answer here. What do you get when the h becomes 0 down here? Well, the second one is still g of x, but the first one also becomes g of x. So I actually get g of x squared on the bottom. This is something weird about the quotient rule. Now, anyway, that's the quotient rule. This is the final form of the quotient rule. What you have is a fraction where the top basically looks like the product rule, although it has a minus in it instead of a plus. And it's all divided by that weird... Uh, g of x squared, which really comes from making the common denominator. So I will just write this again. And this also you need to have memorized, although hopefully you'll do this enough times so that everything will just make sense. It's like that. I suppose maybe I didn't have to rewrite the whole thing. That's what it is. This is called the quotient rule. All right, and I actually, you know, for this one, it is uh, a little bit more complicated to remember, and you actually do have to put things in the proper order, or else you might mess up the minus sign up there. For instance, you cannot just rearrange the order of these two things. It's no longer equal. In the product rule, it would be equal because it was a plus, but since it's a minus, that will actually change the answer. Um, I have a, a pretty stupid way of remembering this thing which you can take it or leave it. I'm not afraid to, to be stupid in the name of, you know, learning mathematics. If you think of this as high divided by ho. Now, some people say high divided by low, but I prefer ho myself. Um, what's the answer? It is ho d high minus high d ho over ho ho. This is the stupid way that I remember the quotient rule, where the d means derivative. So this here means the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom divided by the bottom squared. That's you get that ho-ho. That's my favorite part. All right? This is the 
stupid way to remember the quotient rule. You can do it that way if you want to. However you want to uh, remember that formula. This one is a little bit complicated. You've got to get it the right way around. All right. Let's just do a quick, simple example. So something like this. Derivative of, you use the quotient rule when you have a fraction. All right. Perhaps you ask yourself, can I just take the derivative on the top and on the bottom? The answer is no, you can't. It don't work that way. Um, you will get some answer, but that's not the correct answer. It's just more complicated than that. Just because of the way that um, derivatives work, when you have a denominator in a derivative, it's a whole mess with the common denominators and all that, right? So you cannot just do the simple looking thing. Anyway, I do the quotient rule. I get the bottom, which is 3x to the fifth plus x, times the derivative of the top, which is 2x plus 2. This is my whole d high, and then I go minus the top, x squared plus 2x minus 1, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 15x to the 4 plus 1. All of this divided by the bottom squared, which is 3x to the 5 plus x squared. That's my answer. Again, you should not feel any obligation to simplify it any more than that, unless I specifically asked you to. There is no real reason to. I mean, you could if you want to foil this and then like do a multiply that out and then recombine everything. I would say don't bother unless you have a good reason to, such as I told you to. Or if I asked you, for instance, a question like this, if I said, tell me when the derivative is zero. Or tell me when the slopes are horizontal. That's not easy, but you would have to take this, set this whole thing equal to zero, and then solve for x. In that case, you would have to actually simplify all that stuff. But uh, if I don't ask you to do anything uh, extra like that, then just leave it. Drop the mic and back away. All right? Any questions about that? That is the quotient rule. Unfortunately, slightly more complicated formula than the product rule. All right? So, oh no, I think this is like a bad wire. Sometimes I jiggle it and it <coughs> disconnects, sorry. Well, it dinged. It's good when it dings. All right, um, I have another wire, I'll swap it. Let's talk a little bit about what, uh, so far, what kinds of functions do we know how to take the derivative of? We can do, so far, we can do, like, very basically, first of all, any power of x, x to the n, for n, uh, a positive integer, that is a whole number, right? Um, or any polynomial, more generally, or any product of a polynomials, but that, I mean, the product of a polynomial is another polynomial, but we could also do any quotient, right? Any product or quotient of a polynomial. All right. Our goal, like by the end of the semester, is that you would be able to take the derivative of basically any function you can imagine, or at least any function that, that is like built out of ordinary things that you've seen before in your life, including the trig functions, even uh, exponential logarithms. All those things we're going to talk about eventually. But for now, what we know is polynomials and products and quotients of polynomials. And in fact, uh, we have only really talked about powers of x, where the power is a positive number. Actually, now that we know the quotient rule, we can also do negative exponents. So let's talk about this. The derivative of x to the n where n is negative, still um, an integer. Integer means a whole number. What if the n is a negative integer, all right? I'm thinking of something like, you know, x to the minus 3. How can you take the derivative of x to the minus 3? Well, in fact, you can use the quotient rule. Check it out. I'm talking about something like that, right? Where the exponent is negative, x to the minus 3. 
uh, n, where n, n could be any whole number. Yeah, can I rewrite this as a fraction? That's what I want to do. So I'm not doing the derivative yet, but just rewriting. Instead of x to the minus n, do you remember what it should look like as a fraction? Yeah, it just goes like that. Whatever the negative exponent is, like x to the minus 3 means 1 over x to the 3. That's what a negative exponent means, all right? But now, from there, we can actually use the quotient rule to take the derivative of this, all right? So let's try it. I do. Remember your quotient rule? It's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom divided by the bottom squared. So I begin with the bottom, which is x to the n, times the derivative of the top. So here I'm doing the quotient rule, the qr. What's the derivative of the top in this case? I see someone give me the hand signal. It's this. It's zero, right? The derivative of the top is one, the constant one and the derivative of a constant is 0. So this is x to the n times 0 minus, that was the bottom times derivative of the top, and now I go minus the top, which is 1, times derivative of the bottom. Can anyone say what's the derivative of the bottom, which is x to the n? Yeah, yeah great. n x to the n minus 1. This is how, this because we know that's the derivative of uh, an ordinary power of x with a positive power of x. All right, and then by, uh, divided by the bottom squared, x to the n to the squared. All right? Let's see if we can, can we simplify this at all? I mean, that is the answer, which usually I say don't bother simplifying, but the whole point of this, I'm trying to uh, get to a nice formula for this. So first of all, that is just <coughs> 0, right? x to the n times 0 just goes away entirely. Um, so I have minus n x to the n minus 1 up top, and on the bottom, x to the n squared. Anyone uh, master of exponents? What, what happens with, with this configuration? I want to write this just as a single power of x. How do you handle that? Yeah, you multiply the exponents in this situation, so it would be just x to the 2n. Um, and then I could say this is negative n times, just to factor out that constant, x to the n minus 1 divided by x to the 2n. Can we simplify that at all? What would you do um, over here to simplify? Remember how to simplify those guys? Yeah, you would subtract the exponents in this case. So it's x to the n minus 1 minus 2n, which I guess those, those n's could combine up there. x to the, I think minus n minus 1 is what it's going to be. Or you could say minus 1 minus n. Same thing. All right. Uh, anyway, can, I, can we summarize? It's not going to get any simpler than that. So... For negative exponents, in summary, derivative of x to the minus n is minus n x to the minus n minus 1. All right? That's what we got at the end there. Now, ordinarily, I would say put this in a box and memorize it, although I would like to point out this is actually the same rule that we've already always used, right? Because what you see happening here is the exponent came down into the front, and then I subtracted one from the exponent. This is the same as the other rule about, you know, x to the n. So actually, this rule, derivative of x to the power n equals n x to the n minus 1. The conclusion is really this same rule also works even if n is negative. The same thing also works. You still multiply the n down to the front and you, you decrease it by 1, right? Because it is the same rule right here. So this works actually, I'll tell you, this actually works for any integer. I would say positive or negative, right? Because when you do a negative power, that I mean, it means it's a fraction and you've got to do the quotient rule and everything, but it all ends up working anyway, right? And so this formula here, the power rule, 
is sort of uh, even better than we thought, right? It works not just for positive uh, integer exponents, but it works for any integer exponents. Um, this naturally raises the question, what about other numbers which are not integers? Integer means a whole number. So what about another number that is not integers? How about <coughs> non-integers? A number which is not a whole number? Um, can you still do the same rule? The answer I'm telling you is yes. Actually, this works for any number at all. Although we're not, we're not really going to see exactly why for a few more times, but I'll tell you right now. Actually, it works for any real number. Uh, for example, it works for x to the one half. It's a true fact. The derivative of x to the one half is one half times x. And then what's the exponent going to be now? Uh, some of you have done this before. You always multiply the exponents in the front and then you decrease the exponent by one. So what will it, what will it be? Yeah. Yeah, negative one half. It used to be one half and I subtract one. One half minus one is negative one half. Yeah. It works, this rule here works for any real number. That actually is not obvious, and you can't prove that using the quotient rule. We're going to get to that, but um, it involves something related to the chain rule to actually see why this works. Um, you'll have to just let me tell you about it later. All right, so for example, this, uh, and actually remember, um, x to the one-half power is the same as the square root of x. Actually, this allows you to do derivatives of anything involving square roots and even uh, other kinds of roots. So the derivative of um, something like the cube root of x. The idea is I first rewrite this as a power of x. And remember, what's the cube root in terms of a power? x to the something or other? Yeah, this is x to the one-third. Right? The square root is the one-half power. The cube root is the one-third power. You know, whatever root is always the power 1 over whatever the, the root is. Uh, anyway, what's that? I go 1 third in the front, x to the whatever 1 third minus 1 is negative 2 thirds. So that's the derivative of the cube root x. All right? These non-integer exponents are going to come up all the time. Every time, basically, whenever you see a radical sign, you should try to rewrite it as an exponent because it's... In this class, basically never helpful to write it using the root sign. You always want to use the radical sign. Anyone remember, how do you handle something like this? The fifth root of x to the 9, can I rewrite that using an exponent? I can. Yes. So actually, when I wrote it this way around, that's x to the 9 to the power 1 fifth. But that you can write more simply. Uh, by multiplying the exponents, it's just x to the 9 fifths, right? So translate the radical into a uh, power of x, x to the 9 fifths. I hope you can see that okay. 9 fifths. And then, so I didn't actually, to actually do the derivative, you multiply that down front, 9 fifths times x to the power, what's the new power going to be? You subtract 1. Yeah. Four fifths, yeah. Nine fifths minus one. One is five fifths, so you do nine fifths minus one. You get the idea. Four fifths. Great. All right. Well, you can even do weird things like I will conclude by saying, what's the derivative of x to the power pi? Pi is especially weird because it's not a it's it's an irrational number, right? It's not a fraction at all. But you can still do the same trick, pi x to the pi minus 1, all right? Uh, I'm trying to emphasize that that trick works when the exponent is any real number, not just a, uh, not just a fraction, not just a whole number. Although I would ask you, um, this is a little something to think about. What is that? x to the power pi. Have you, I don't know, have you ever thought about what exact, what does that even mean, x to the power pi? Um, like, we know what x to the power 3 means. 
It means x times x times x, right? If I had some other, some, some rational number up top, x to the power of like 3.5, for instance, what does that mean? <coughs> can, can anyone say, what does that mean? I mean, I know you can type it into your calculator, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, you could write it that way if you like. X to the 1 times x to the 1 times x to the 1 times x to the 1 half, right? And you know what all those things mean, right? The last one is, is the root x. So this, another way you could think this through is 3.5 is 7 over 2, isn't it? And then this, you could say, is the square root of x to the 7, right? So that's, that's another way of saying what that means. How about like x to the uh, 3.61? I just made that up. But this, if you really had to think this through, I would say x to the 3.61 is the same as x to the power 361 divided by 1,000, which means the 1,000th root of x to the 361. That's what that means. Now, of course, you just plug it into your calculator and get the answer. But if you really wanted to say specifically, that's what it means. What about this, though? x to the pi. The same trick does not work. You can't just, um, <coughs> my, my, my trick here was to turn that number into a fraction and then write it as a radical. Pi is not a fraction, though. This means, I would just say, huh? Um, actually, it, do, it, it does mean something, but um, it, the definition usually is done in terms of logarithms. Like this actually requires a, a much more complicated definition than anything that, um, well, it involves logarithms. It's, it's basically the natural, I want to get into it? No. Um, this is something, we'll, we'll talk about this eventually, but I just thought I would bring to our attention that I said this formula works for any real number in the exponent, although, you should be suspicious about any real number in the exponent, even an irrational number. Those are very weird functions indeed, um, where the, the meaning is not even clear what it's supposed to mean. But the formula still works, though, even for those very weird ones. All right. We got like five minutes, but uh, I, this is all I was... Oh, I had one more thing to say, which will not take five minutes, but I, I want to get this down here. So, a little beware. You can use that formula... And it is true for any number n, the derivative of x to the n equals n x to the n minus 1, right? For any number n, this is absolutely true. That's the power rule. It's great. But you cannot do it for something like this, 2 to the power x. This uses a completely different rule. So this, but I will say the derivative of that is not equal to x times 2 to the x minus 1. This power rule, it only works when you have x downstairs and a, a number upstairs, like a constant, all right? If you have other variables inside the exponents, you cannot use this rule at all. You need a completely different set of rules. So I will just say this is 2 to the x is totally different. There are rules for that, but um, it's not this rule, right? We're going to talk about this eventually, but... Uh, it's a, it's a different rule, which, which is more, it's, it's more complicated than what I just wrote. All right, I think that'll do it for today. Do them homeworks. Please let me know if you have questions. I would be happy to uh, try and help out. Thank you. Yeah, see you.